Good morning. Good morning. I'm reading from Isaiah chapter 58, verses 1 through 10. Well, first, I'm adjusting a music stand. <laughs> Shout it aloud. Do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their rebellion and to the descendants of Jacob their sins. For day after day they seek me out. They seem eager to know my ways, as if they were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commands of its God. They ask me for just decisions and seem eager for God to come near them. Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you have not noticed? Yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please and exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of fast I have chosen? Only a day for people to humble themselves. Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying in sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen? To loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke. Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter when you see the naked to clothe them and not turn away from your own flesh and blood? Then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and he will say, here am I. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing finger and malicious talk, if you spend yourselves on behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like noonday. Friends, I invite you to join me in a, 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 few, a moment of silent prayer. And I invite you to turn your attention to your breath. And as you breathe in, let's together acknowledge that we are breathing in the presence of God, the presence of the divine who, who is always available to us. Let's pray. God, we know that you are always speaking, always calling to us. Today we pray that by the power of your spirit, we would hear, we would receive, and we would follow. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Well, as my dear friend BJ said, my name's Leanne, and I am the pastor of City View Church on the north side. Some of you might know my husband, Wayne Younger, who is the executive director of Open Hand Ministries. I understand that this church is one of the ministry partners with that, that organization. Um, we've raised three now young adults um, who, quite, quite frankly, I want you to know that I'm grateful, right, to be here because after just getting the last one out of the house, I am happy to be in a place where people are forced to listen to me. Okay, so, so welcome and thank you. Uh, Thursday I started a Lenten journey with some of your congregants here where we're focusing on the habits and practices that might help us reclaim some of the God-given wisdom inherent in our bodies, inherent in the, the lives that our ancestors lived, inherent in the earth itself. I, I understand that there's still time for you to get in on that, right? If you decide today that maybe you want to hang out with that group, you're, you're welcome to come. 
Um, but today, I'm here to talk a little about the passage read early, I just read from Isaiah 58. One of the things I, I, I think we need to know is that the words of the prophet in this passage were most likely referring to life at a time either during the Babylonian exile, in other words, when Israel, the Hebrews were captured and carried away from their, from their promised land into exile, or shortly after their return. So they, they're either near, they're near the end of the exile or they're trying to put their lives back together. And the picture painted by the prophet's words were that at this point in Israel's history, they were doing it all right. Verse two, for day after day they seek me out, they seem eager to know my ways, as if they were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commands of its God. They ask me for just decisions and seem eager for God to come near them. Dare I say it this way, they were doing all the things, right? They were doing all the things. The Bible studies, the meetings, the prayers at the right time of day. And you know what? It all made sense that they were absolutely intent on doing it all right. Because the cultural understanding of the reason for their defeat and captivity by the Babylonian Empire was that they were unfaithful and their captivity was understood, and you, you can read that through the prophets, as a judgment of God, from God. So it's likely that diligent, hyper-attentive religious practice was considered essential to prevent another exile. In other words, God's going to get us if we don't do it right. God's going to get us again, and we don't want that to happen. And yet, the words of this passage, the words of the prophet, make it clear that in the mind of God, the people of God were missing the point. Verse 3, yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please and exploit all your workers. Verses 5 and 6, is this not the kind of fast I've chosen? Is this the kind of fast I've chosen? Only a day for people to humble themselves? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying in sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the kind of fast I, I have chosen? In other words, isn't this what I told you to do? Loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke to set the oppressed free and break every yoke. There are other pictures in scripture of this kind of missing the point. We heard it in the gospel lesson where in Matthew 25, we, we hear uh, both the folks characterized as unfaithful and the folks characterized as faithful. And parenthetically, I just wanna let you know, I think we're all a little bit of both, okay? We're all a little sheep, a little goat. So that, that's a sermon for another time, okay? Um, but they all say, when did we see you? They were doing whatever they thought was the right thing. But the question is the same, where were you? We didn't see you. In Matthew 23, Jesus pronounces woes on religious leaders, the people who believe they have it right. And he says, woe to you because you go halfway around the world to create a convert and you make him twice the son of hell as he ever was. Isaiah chapter one, um, is one of my favorites, especially uh, 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 this, this type of reminder from God, especially the message version, because Isaiah chapter one, if you, you may or may not be familiar with it, it's essentially saying all these feasts, all these religious celebrations, they're a waste of time because you're abusing the poor. But in the, in the message version, it has just the right amount of snark in it, right? It, and, and Eugene Peterson characterizes God uh, through the prophet saying, meetings, meetings, meetings. Right? What are you doing? I didn't invite you to another meeting, essentially. Listen, we could look through scripture and see more of this picture, but we can also look through our own history as people of faith. John Eliot is well known as the um, widely understood to be the, the first missionary to Native Americans uh, in this continent. And, um, and his training, his desire to do the work of God led him to create a place that he referred to as the praying village, where if, if a native person was to qualify as being a part of the kingdom of God, 
They had to leave their family and village. They had to cut their hair. They had to dress like Englishmen and work the way in jobs that Englishmen would have. Trained seminarian, lauded missionary, missing the point. We could look further in history and see times where the church put its imprint on, its approval imprint on declaring black and brown bodies um, destined to be enslaved or to, to be slaughtered. Or even today, we live with aspects of the church putting their approval on denying the humanity of our LGBTQ siblings. Now, I, I could look at my own life, right? We can look at the scripture, we can look at history. I can look at my own life and see examples of where I'm doing all the things and yet missing the point. And this, this leads me to make a little confession to all of you about the time when Carlos, a 10-year-old young boy who was the son of a single mom, lived across the street from me. Now, I told you about those young adults who were out, but he lived with his mom. Carlos lived across the street from us when my kids were about his age. And because his mom was working hard to keep him out of trouble, Carlos never got very far from his house. And in fact, what he did was he sat on his stoop, staring at my stoop, waiting for my kids to come out and play. A natural thing, right? But guess what happens when your mom's a pastor? There's no time to hang out with the neighborhood kid because we've got to go to church to do ministry. Quite literally, I would tell my kids, hurry up and get in the car and don't talk to Carlos because we don't have time. We've got to go do all the things. Missing the point. We can look at scripture. We can look at history. I can look at my life. I think you could probably look at yours. But we all could look at the city that we live in. We live in a city that at one point could have been said to have a church on every corner. And yet, in this city, where there's still almost a church on every corner, we lack enough housing for people who need it. In other words, we're, I'm not even talking about, I'm not even talking about the people who, who, who are so far at the bottom where nobody knows what to do. I'm talking about families who can't, uh, get into a house because there's none available. And yet, we have plenty of Airbnbs. We live in a city where the county jail is a, a place where over 50% of the people there have not been convicted of anything. And yet, some of you may know this, some of you may not know this, we have in this county, in our city, the jail that has the highest per capita death rate of jails its size. So folks are going to jail because they're too poor to pay for bail to go home, and then facing medical crises and mental health crises, and some of them are not coming out of lives, all before they ever get to trial. In this city, where some of us are doing all the things, and yet missing the point. Is it possible? Is, is this possible? How is it possible that the practice of the very things we trust will bring us closer to God can actually have the opposite effect? In other words, while we're, 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 some of us are diving deep in our devotion, we're actually being pulled further and further away from those that we're called to love tangibly and, and in tangible and justice advancing ways. How is it that we, the people of God, have grown so numb to the suffering of those right outside of our door? So listen, I'm not a pres Presbyterian. I'm kind of a, an anglo baptocostal something or other, okay? <laughs> uh, but because I'm trying to be a good Presbyterian, I have three points, okay? <laughs> Point number one, some time ago, there was a survey of folks who named themselves Christian, and it, it revealed that the longer you are a part of a church family, of a faith community, the less likely you are to be connected to people who are outside of that community, outside of that practice. And, and so what happens then 
is that the influence of what I'll, I, I'll call the grind culture, the, the way that we work at everything, we work at our spirituality too, don't we? Right? Has many of us practicing the spiritual devotion Olympics, basically, right? And we're achieving individual spiritual triumph while being pulled further away from each other and especially the folks suffering at the margins of society. It is really hard to accept your neighbor's suffering if you know them. Point number two, I think we confuse charity for justice often. The call to set the oppressed free is more than a call to give just a little more from our excess. It's a call to fundamentally reorganize the way that we live as a human community. It's a call to give up more than our excess. It's to give more of our comfort, of our convenience, so that others can have enough. In my, in my congregation, we give out uh, food from 412 Food Rescue every week, and it's a beautiful thing. Food that would be thrown away goes into the hands of people who really need it. And that group of who needs it is getting broader and broader every week. We, we started out with folks from the street, and now we've got people who have jobs who are saying, food is so expensive, I can't buy lunch. That's why I'm here. And that's a beautiful thing. But I want you to know that that's charity, not justice. Justice is wrapped up in the question, why are people hungry? Why do we have food to throw away when other people don't have food to eat? And then the act of justice is how we engage, get our lives engaged in answering that, answering that question and responding to the changes that need to be made. I actually think some of us need to ask why some of our charities exist. What's the real underlying problem? Why, friends, I would ask you, are food and shelter charity and not just a part of what it means to be a human? in God's created world. Point number three, many of us have grown up listening to the words of God as transactional rather than an invitation. So for example, you, we hear the promises of God sort of in a, if this happens, then this will happen. If you do this, then I'll do this. And what many of us hear is sort of this kind of exchange of goods, right? God, I'll give you this if you give me that. And what we also hear, mostly because we learned it as children, is that if we don't do this, then things will be really, really bad for us. In, in my day, I'm, I'm a little bit old, maybe. I don't know, am I old? I'm not sure. I'm older than you, but... <laughs> um, but I, in my day, the phrase was, you better get right or get left, <laughs> right? Like, just do it right or, or you're in trouble. But what if we heard the words of Isaiah 58 as an invitation today? Not simply as individuals, because here's the thing, I, I preach at my own church, I preach in other places, and I know most of us sit and we hear and we're like, okay, so this means I have to do better. This means I have to do something. Okay, I'm gonna do a little less on the spiritual calisthenics, and I'm gonna give a little more food somewhere. I'm gonna do something. This is an invitation in Isaiah 58 throughout scripture to community. God was speaking to a group of people. And so a friend of mine, I love it, he, he likes to say, the you in scripture is actually yens, okay? Yens guys. And if we were in Philly, it would be you guys, right? You are all looking for me, says the creator in Isaiah 58. And you know what? I'm at the jail. I'm on the corner. I'm at Tent City where people are living because they don't have houses. Come closer, you're looking for me. I'm right here, come closer. The invitation of God in this passage, friends, is to be an agent of God's healing in the world, but it is also to find your own healing as well. Many of us, live in sort of a spiritually dry place. And I would say passage after passage after passage in scripture would 
say that the divine has told us where we could find them. Share your food with the hungry. Provide the poor wanderer with shelter. When you see the naked, clothe them. Then your light will break forth like dawn and your healing will quickly appear. If you spend yourselves on behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like noonday. Here we are on the first Sunday of Lent, a time of re reflection and repentance. And today, friends, I wanna invite you to receive the invitation of God to repent, and, and by that I mean take action, turn around, change your direction, change your habit to get closer to the God who loves us all by getting closer to the places and the people where the divine told us they would be. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Thank you.